It was around 5.30 p.m. I was walking in the street to my dormitory since my home is far away from my school. There were only three to five people passing by that street at that time. While walking, I was texting my boyfriend, asking him if I could come over that night since I have a project to make and my laptop's being an ass. It won't turn on, so I was hoping I could borrow his laptop. And then when I looked up, there was an old man walking towards me. The street was narrow, so I stopped and moved away to the side to make room for him when he did the same. I nervously laughed and moved to the other side, and he copied me again. This time, I felt a bit nervous. Um, excuse me, I muttered. I tried to get away from him, but he kept blocking my direction. Then he laughed and moved away. I felt relieved. I quickly walked past him, and then he stomped his feet behind me. I got startled, and then he laughed. I thought he was just a crazy old man. I told my boyfriend about it, and he asked me if I was okay, so I told him not to worry. Around 7 p.m., I was at the jeepney stop waiting for a jeepney to arrive because I was going to my boyfriend's apartment since it was 45 minutes and two rides away. 30 or 45 minutes later, there was one jeepney with only five passengers, so I hopped in. One by one, the passengers got off the jeepney until I was the only one left. Drop me off by the terminal, please, I said. He didn't say a word, just kept on driving. When we finally got into the terminal, he didn't stop. Um, just drop me off here, please, I told him again. Then I saw his face in the rearview mirror. It was the crazy man from earlier. I panicked. He was looking at me, smiling. I immediately called my boyfriend, since we don't have 911 here. He wasn't picking up. I didn't know what to do. Should I jump off the Jeep? Then suddenly a group of friends halted the Jeep and he stopped. I immediately got off and ran. I might have looked like a maniac to those teenagers, but I didn't care. I called my boyfriend again, who finally picked up. He had just got off from school and I told him everything. He picked me up where I was, and since then he never let me travel at night. When I was 18, I only just recently got out of a relationship with a significant other, and I wanted to see other people. I took up online dating on this app that I don't want to name. I never told my parents about my previous relationship, or the guys that I talked to online, so they know nothing about this story. But I still need to tell them one day. Anyway, within a short period of time, I received lots of messages from guys. Most of them were perverts, or just didn't catch my attention, until a cute guy messaged me. I forgot his name, so we'll just call him Justin. Justin was around 23 years old at the time. When he messaged me, he told me how attractive I was and showered me with affection and romantic text messages. I was naive at the time, so I was awed and blushed when he told me all that. We started to get to know each other. He was living in Canada and I was a Polish girl living in the United States. We had a few hobbies in common and we both went to college. I was studying to be a police officer to get an associate's degree and he was going to university to get a bachelor's degree. Then eventually, his messages started to make me uncomfortable. He said that he preferred white girls over Asian girls and that he always wanted to have sex with a white girl. He asked me if I was still a virgin, and even though I felt uncomfortable, I said yes. He started talking to me sexually, and I didn't like it, but I complied. Then he asked me if I could visit him sometime in Canada, even though I just met him a couple days ago. Living with my parents in a strict Polish household, I told him that I couldn't because of that. He then argued that I was an adult and I could make my own decisions, which was true, but as a Polish person, you still have to listen to your parents even though you're an adult. Of course, I did tell him that I lived in the United States, but I didn't tell him exactly where I live. He then asked me if I lived in XYZ town in XYZ state. 
I was shocked when he asked this because I never told him exactly where I lived and on my profile, I did not give out my location, so I have no idea how he found out about that. I lied to him and said that I didn't, but he said I was lying and I confessed. Then he asked me for my address, but I refused to give it to him. He got angry and said that everyone gave their address out, which of course I knew wasn't true. I then blocked him, but the story doesn't end there. A few weeks later, I heard that in my neighborhood, there was a break-in. Two men broke into a house, but they didn't steal anything. Instead, they might have been looking for someone. My heart jumped when I heard this. Justin was looking for me. A couple houses later, and they gave up. I waited a while later, and I have not heard about anything like this again. I dread to think what might have happened if Justin found the right house in my neighborhood and kidnapped me. I was 16 when this happened to me, and it still haunts me to this day. My older brother's friend gave me work of house sitting his rather large house for two days, with the pay rate being 100 a night. For the sake of privacy reasons, let's call my brother's friend Nick. $200 was a lot for such a simple task as house sitting, and since I recently sold my PlayStation 3 to save up for a PlayStation 4, the job came as godsend. At around 6 p.m., Nick picked me up and drove me to his house, as it was getting dark out. Once we got there, he told me about the security cameras he had installed in and out of his home, but I didn't have any intentions of staring at any security monitor all night as I had brought my laptop to pass the time. After some time had passed, I felt hungry and decided to grab something from the fridge. But as I got up to make my way down, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye from the monitor. I sat back down, closing my laptop and taking a closer look, noticing the movement coming from camera 4. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that it was a silhouette of what appeared to be a man standing outside the house. Within seconds of glancing away from the monitor, The man was gone. At that very moment, I heard glass shatter somewhere downstairs, causing me to immediately look at the cameras, noticing him crawling in through the basement window at an alarming rate. I started to panic, watching him climb the basement stairs with a knife clenched in his hand. I quickly locked the door to my room and dialed 911, explaining everything. I watched the monitor, terrified to see the man on the same floor as mine, desperately opening and closing the doors, looking for anyone to cross his path. I pressed my ear against the door, straining to hear his now slowed footsteps approach my door as he attempted to open it. Realizing I was in there, he began to shout and pound on the door aggressively, frightening me to the very core. As I sat there shaking, I heard sirens in the distance, steadily getting louder and louder. My fear quickly disappeared as I heard the man run towards the stairs, attempting to escape his fate. When I heard the front door slam open, accompanied by somebody yelling, Police! Put your hands in the air! Moments later, I walked downstairs and saw the intruder in a pair of handcuffs being escorted to the police cruiser. I thanked one of the officers and called Nick, explaining everything to him. After about 20 minutes, he picked me up and took me home. But I got no sleep that night. All I could think of was how lucky I was to be alive. And if the cops hadn't shown up when they did, I wouldn't be here to tell this story. I've been followed by creeps before and in one case was almost assaulted. I was never truly scared about that type of stuff. I've been through a lot in my life and I consider myself to be pretty strong. Even when some creep attempted to assault me, I wasn't scared because I knew I was going to beat his ass. And I did. I never feel threatened unless I get my gut feeling. I know when something bad's going to happen or if someone is a shady character, etc. My friends tell me I have some type of sixth sense. I'm not one for superstition, but I also have to agree it gets really weird and I'm almost always right. One day, I got the worst gut feeling I ever had in my life. I was in my first year of college living in some very nice apartments. 
I love living there. It was a Friday and I needed to head to the bank before it closed because I forgot to cash in my check beforehand. I left my house, locked the door and started heading towards my car. Right as I left the hallway of my apartment complex and started walking, a beat up rusty truck pulled up as if on cue. There were two guys inside. One was a pretty big guy with tattoos and looked like he just got out of prison and the other one was super skinny with glasses. The second I laid my eyes on them, I had my gut feeling kick in. It was worse than usual and I immediately felt like shit. The big guy was driving and started to tell me things like, You are so beautiful, come over here, let's talk. You are the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I didn't want to walk to my car because I didn't want them to know what car I drive. And I didn't want to walk back to my house because I lived on the first floor which is easier to break into, and if they didn't know already where I lived, I wanted to keep them from finding out. So I started walking to the front office of the apartment complex, which was a little far away. I already had my pocket knife out, but hidden in my sweater sleeve. They kept calling out, trailing me as I walked to the office. I kept my eye on them so I knew what they were up to. They eventually asked me to go to a party with them. The big guy said, we're having a party at 2 a.m. at a friend's house who lives here. Wanna come? We can all hang out beforehand and get to know each other before we go. It was around 3.30 p.m. at the time, just for your information. I ignored them and told them, no, stop bothering me. They kept trying to persuade me by saying nice things and stuff. And eventually they both said, if you come with us, we'll give you a free pair of shoes. The skinny guy then leans back and starts digging around the back seat. I stopped to look because I wanted to make sure he wasn't gonna grab a gun or duct tape or some shit like that. I was a good few feet away from the truck and took a running position just in case. He pulls out a dark blue suitcase from the back seat and opens it. Inside there are maybe 100 different pairs of shoes. The sizing ranged from a small pink Dora the Explorer shoe to an adult-sized woman's stilettos. That's the moment where my gut feeling went into a frenzy. My knees became so weak, I threw up on the spot. I've never felt so sick and felt so disgusted in my entire life. I felt pure evil. I screamed no, and they became extremely angry and began to get out of the car. I booked it. In the street, my neighbor's little kids were playing outside. I snatched them up and ran all the way to the front office. No way I was gonna leave these little kids behind with some fucking freaks. The minute we got there, I told the front office and they called the cops. And I called the kid's mother. I told them that her kids were with me and not to leave the house in case they were still out there. I didn't want them to find out where she lived either. After that, for the next few days, I was terrified to leave my house. So terrified, I had my friend come and stay with me for about a week. On the fourth day, we were getting ready to leave to go get food. And while I was locking the door, my friend said, That's a shitty looking truck. I turned around, and it was those guys in the truck right in front of my house. We ran back inside. Apparently, they had been stalking out my place for a while. They were never caught, and I never saw them again after the apartments cracked down on security. I learned about serial killers in school and found out some take trophies of their victims. I always thought back and wondered, what if all those shoes were trophies? Needless to say, I no longer live there. When I was 17, I didn't have a driver's license. Most of the time I walk or hitchhike. There was this one night. There weren't that many cars on the road, and it was very cold, and this man pulled over. When the guy pulled over, I, I took a good look at the guy and figured I could take him if he tried anything. He was on the slender side and had a strange frailness about him, even though he looked healthy enough. I got into the car after we agreed on the destination. We exchanged names and I warmed my fingers up in front of the heating unit. He spoke quietly, asking a few questions along the lines of, was I local and 
How did I like living there? He said he only been here for a few months, but found it beautiful and hoped he could find happiness there. That comment struck me as a little odd, but I brushed it off. It began to snow and the road quickly got slippery. So he slowed and he kept his eyes straight out the windshield, driving silently. I was okay with that, as small talk was never my forte. About 10 minutes later, I noticed the car near the intersection we were approaching seemed to be sliding, so I said, watch out. He immediately hit the gas, shooting through the intersection and burst out with, don't ever scream at me. Needless to say, I was taken aback. I said, look, this is close enough. Just pull over here and I can get there. He didn't seem to hear me. So I said, Richard, did you hear me? I said, you can pull over here and let me out. But no response. He just stared straight ahead, driving faster now than he did when it started snowing. To say I was scared doesn't seem to cover the death of the fear that began to arise in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was damn sure not going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile, he began to mumble under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed he was speaking to me. So I said, what did you say? I couldn't hear you. He began to speak quietly and rapidly saying things like, you're always yelling at me. I've told you time and time again, do not yell at me. I don't appreciate it. No, you don't listen. You don't listen. And I was just sitting there looking at him. I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to say in response or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car, but next that I did when I realized the door lock was missing. There was just a silver lined hole where it should have been. I started to cry and debate with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and hoping for the best. When he suddenly looked at me for the first time since I had gotten in the car, he blinked several times rapidly, then slowed the car, pulling into a gas station. I waited to see if he unlocked the doors, not wanting to say anything to set him off again. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I think I better let you out of here. And he hit the button to the door locks and he opened the door. I wasn't about to hesitate, so I jumped out of the car as if I were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so damn sad and I hesitated. He apologized, said he was sorry if he had frightened me, that he never would have harmed me. And he asked if I'd be able to get home okay. I said I would and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station, but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple of moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the hell was up and was about to run into the gas station, but he opened his window and yelled at me, waving something in his hand, my hat. I left it on his seat. I slowly approached the side of his car and he handed it to me, apologizing again. I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure he was out of sight before moving on so he wouldn't know which direction I was heading. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on, and a piece of paper fell out of it. Folded into a paper was a hundred dollar bill. The paper said, I'm sorry, please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. In fact, it was the last time I ever hitchhiked in my life. Will never, ever do that again. This story is totally true. It happened to me when I was about four years old. My dad used to really like going on vacation with me and my family. One time, we went to what I think was Big Bear, but I'm not sure. Anyways, we rented a cabin. I don't remember much, but I remember the inside of the cabin was beautiful. The furniture was all colorful and decorated in Christmas colors. 
but it was around Christmas time. It was very roomy, and it was two floors and had its own den, kitchen, and bedroom. We arrived during the day, and everything seemed normal. When night came, however, we started hearing noises. It sounded like someone was shaking the front door knob trying to get in. I was the first to notice, and I told my mom. But she didn't believe me. Then she saw it too. For a couple of minutes, the front door knob just kept shaking by itself, and we were too afraid to go look out the door. Then we heard another noise. It sounded like steel hitting steel. Then it stopped. My dad was afraid someone was trying to break in. So we packed up all of our things so we can leave. But before we did, my dad called the police and asked them to come search the premises. We exited out the back door because the noises were coming from the front. Our car was down the hill from the back of the cabin. I fell asleep in the car and woke up the next morning in a small rinky-dink motel room that was nothing as roomy and beautiful as the cabin. I was so bummed but I was quickly relieved we had left because later that day, we found out who was making those noises. The police had arrived there and searched the outside and found nothing. Then they went inside and found a man that had two hooks instead of hands. He had been twisting the door knob with his hook. Then he clashed his hooks together and that's what we heard was it still on steel. We found out that about five minutes after we left the cabin, he successfully broke in and started searching for us. The police found bodies stashed in the upstairs closet. When we were on our way home from the motel, we stopped at a gas station near the cabin where the madman had tried to break in. My mom knew it was a bad idea, but my dad told her to relax. The cops took care of that guy. He's nowhere near us. We all went into the little shop to buy some candy and snacks. We were quite surprised when we came out of the shop and headed back to our car. There was a note on the hood that read, There's more of us. See you soon. It's safe to say that we never went back to that cabin again. I was born in 1984. This incident was from 1989. I was five years old then. I'm a guy, the middle child of five siblings. It was late 1989 when my mom was giving birth to our youngest sister. My mom was having labor and my dad and a family friend were taking her to the hospital of our town. My eldest sister and I were left alone at home. I have no clue about ghosts and hauntings by that time. I wasn't sure how much time has passed since they left for the hospital, but I guessed it's about midnight or just before it, when my sister fell asleep. I was sitting beside her on the couch. I am sure I was wide awake and watching my elder sis sleeping. The couch was just by the window, and the window was high above the ground. There's no way anyone could climb up the wall. It was then, at that exact moment, that I saw a hand on the outside of the window pane. The hand of a baby from the wrist upward with the palm facing me. Maybe I was too young to get scared or I didn't know how to react. I'm not sure. I just kept staring at the hand. At that time, I thought that the hand was of my to-be-born younger babies. I can't tell what exactly happened after that. What I'm sure of was that my parents came home the next morning with our new baby sister. I told my mom about the thing after I was 25 years old, but I've got chills when I think about that night. I wonder why I didn't get scared or horrified. Maybe I was too young as I've said before, I don't know. I'm sure I saw what I saw. If that night was not then, but one of these nights, I'd be screaming my lungs out or froze to death. 